Hey, if you've got your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in James chapter uh, 2. It's going to take us a while to get there, forewarning. So if it takes you a while to find the book of James, uh, that's fine. So um, I was uh, scrolling through Facebook, as I do when I am procrastinating doing something that I should be doing. Uh, and I saw an article pop up a couple of weeks ago that uh, caught my eye. It, it caught my eye, despite it being from a particular website that I don't like. Um, that website, you may have heard of it, you may have read things on it. Uh, it's called BuzzFeed, okay? Uh, now, I say I don't like BuzzFeed because I uh, was a media and communication major at AM, so I have a standard uh, for media, right? I, I think it's... It, it, to be considered legitimate media, I just think you should do some basic, basic things. It's a very low standard, okay? The standard is, to be a legitimate website, you cannot run articles like this. 15 hedgehogs with things that look like hedgehogs. This is a real BuzzFeed article. I'm not kidding. Uh, 10 signs your cat is a wizard. My favorite of all of them, 13 potatoes that look like Channing Tatum. I don't know what that's about. I don't know how we can consider that uh, a legitimate news source, but uh, I came across this article that kind of caught my eye, and so I took a look at it. Uh, and the article was 18 everyday products that you have been using wrong your whole life. 18 everyday products you have been using wrong your entire life. So I wanted to share this with you uh, to bless you, uh, to give you a little insight and maybe just something that you can go home with. So I brought a couple uh, of these objects here tonight. The first, uh, I'm not a spaghetti person. Um, my wife knows that. But did you know? Okay, so spaghetti spoon, right? Scoops out little stuff. Some, I, this is the one on the list that I knew, okay? You got this hole in the middle, right? You think that is just to drain the pasta, but no. Did you know that in that hole fits a perfect serving of pasta? Look at that. Look at that. Did you know that? I bet you've been making way too much pasta, haven't you? All right, here, here's, here's this one. Here's this one, all right? So then you're making your pasta, right? You're stirring it up. You're cooking it up if you're one of those people that cook, right? And then... The spoon rest deal. I have gotten in more trouble for just throwing the spoon on the counter and then it dries up and it's all gross. Did you know that your pot comes with a built-in spoon rest? Look at this. Are you glad you came to Lakeway tonight? Hey, amen. We'll see you next week, all right? Um, no, okay. So that one's good. Um, this one, all right, Tic Tacs, right? I, these things, they are mints, but they are candy. Okay, so, right, you just kind of, but then you always, that could have been bad, right? You end up with too many, okay? Did you know, I'll come down for this one. Up above, you got this little tab right there, right? Look at this. Single serving, right there, right there. Amen, hallelujah. All right, yeah, that's right. We can clap for that. Um, all right, which one to do next? This one blew my mind more than any other, all right? So I got this over here at the Circle K today. Uh, it's like something like 79 cents every day any size. It's incredible. So you got this, this top, right? And you know, you can kind of poke the other RB diet or cola. Where Texas, that should say Coke, but it says cola. All right, what you haven't ever noticed, see these little tabs around? Folks, it's a coaster. All right. That's right. That's right. Okay. My, it is amazing. My favorite one of all. Okay. So uh, I'm a millennial. I drink LaCroix. All right. So, um, oh, you stop it. You haters. All right. So we're in Texas, so I can't get arrested for this, right? Are we still good? Still good? Okay. Thank you. All right. It's a plastic straw. So You've, you've opened up a can of Coke before, right? You've opened up something in a can before. You got this little pop top. It pops open. That's it, right? Some people like to put a straw in there, okay? But the problem is then you're, you're all over the place, right? Uh, you know? All right. Look, 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 look. You ready? Tab turns around. Folks, it's a straw holder. Look at that. It'll hold it right there on the edge. Look at that. Hey, thank you. Thank you. All right. New expectation. See, the, you're not going to get that anywhere else, folks. There you go. So <laughs> I'm getting booed uh, from the front row. I'm not going to mention who it is. So, uh, <laughs> so.
So why do I tell you that? Uh, I, I use that as an illustration uh, for, for really a, a lot of what we do day in and day out. Right, because we've all used some level of these products before. Right, we use them perhaps daily. We get in a habit. We get used to doing certain things certain way. All the while, sometimes we miss that layers of purpose and layers of ability if we never take a hard look at it. We can become so habitual. We can become so used to doing the same things over and over again that we miss the layers of meaning in everyday objects, but also in our own souls. So this journey that we've been going on as a church together in looking at our purposes and who God has created us to be is an attempt for us to discover maybe some purposes that you didn't know existed. Right, because in our faith life, sometimes we can become so habitual, we can so normal, normalized, day in, day out. We, we come to church, we pray before a meal, we do very good things, but it gets a routine, it becomes a habit. And when that happens, then we miss the deeper layers of what God wants to do in and through us. And so tonight we're going to look at the next purpose in our lives, uh, and it's one that you've probably heard before, um, that you were shaped to serve God. We're going to talk about service. The, the fancy Bible word for that is works. Okay, so I'll give you a, a forewarning uh, on the outset, uh, as I did last week. We're going to get theological tonight, okay? If you didn't like that last week, you came back this week, so that's your own fault, right? But we're, we're going we're gonna to get some, some deep theological stuff uh, about faith and about works. So before we do that, uh, I, I want to... Um, show you my cards, okay? I, I want to be very clear about where I land on faith versus works uh, so that you're not sitting on the edge of your seat wondering if I'm, the next thing I'm going to say is going to be heretical, okay? I want to lay this out very clearly for all of us. I believe that we are saved by grace through faith. We are saved by grace through faith, if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard that saying for a while, so I want to unpack it just a little bit. We are saved by grace. We are justified by grace. That is the grace of Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life, died the death that we deserve, took our sins upon him for the forgiveness of our sins, and he offers that freely to us, and we call that offering grace. That means no sin that you have performed, are performing, or will perform can keep you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's offered freely to you. That's that by grace part. But we are saved by grace through faith. I believe that, that Jesus Christ is offering every single person who walks the face of the planet the free gift of grace. Saying, I love you, I have forgiven you, I have redeemed you, and I am reconciling you to the Father. He's offering that gift to all of us. Faith, then, is our act of receiving that gift. It's not a work, it's a reception. We, somebody can try to give you a gift over and over and over again, but until you receive that gift, you don't have it. It's like that pesky friend that always tries to pick up the tab. right? That, that's, that's an imperfect metaphor of God. right? He has picked up the tab forever and always, and he is offering you that freedom that you can have in him. We are saved by grace through faith. Not faith and coming to church. Not faith and going out and serving the community. Not faith and praying. Not faith and reading the Bible. It's faith and nothing. Faith plus nothing equals everything. Faith plus nothing equals everything. Paul will say in his uh, epistle to the Romans, he says this, in 328, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He says, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That means it's faith plus nothing. Okay, those are my cards. That's where I land. All right. Let's, uh, if you've got your Bibles or if you're following along on the Bible app, uh, James chapter 2, and I'll read 14 through 19. Remember, faith alone. James writes, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Uh-oh. Can that faith save him? 
If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things that they needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Good job. So do the demons. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. We are saved by faith alone. Uh Uh-oh. Then James, here, we have maybe some works righteousness. We have Definitely somebody who is naked and hungry, and then we have some demons thrown in there, and I'm already like 11 minutes into the sermon. Uh Uh-oh. All right, deep breath, collective. It's going to be okay. We're going to get out of here on time. All right, so I think what's helpful in this conversation uh, is first to start by defining these terms. I've already said that faith is that reception of the gift of grace that God is giving to us, giving to all people. That's what faith is. Then what are works? I was really hoping that the Greek would outline something very clear to me. Uh, It did not. What the Greek says is that this word for works uh, is our conduct, our deeds, and how we live our lives. Basic definition, right? So I think it's fair to say that when we look at the Bible and we look at what it talks about in works, we kind of see a bunch of different stuff happening. On the one hand, it's, a, it's avoiding things that are bad. On the other hand, it's doing good stuff for people or doing good stuff for God. So I think it's helpful to define this word works um, by something that John Wesley, who started Methodism, what he kind of outlined. And what John Wesley said is that when you gather in small groups, he was the first champion of really small groups, he said when you gather in small groups, ask some questions. Keep each other accountable. And what he said to keep each other accountable for is what we call the three general rules. All right, those are in your notes. Number one, they're pretty simple. Do no harm. Don't do bad stuff. Don't sin. Number two, do good. Do good stuff. Help people out. Love one another. And number three, a more modern translation of it, would be stay in love with God. Stay in love with God. Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. I think those three rules kind of capture what the Bible talks about when it talks about works. It's both an abstaining from things that are bad for us against the laws and ordinances of God, but at the same time, it's doing good things as well. So then as James lays it out, the question becomes, does our faith save us or do our works save us? Right, that's sort of the juxtaposition we have here between faith and between works. And this has been a debate, some historical background here, that has been going on literally since the first Christians. Okay, the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 is all about this debate of whether faith saves you or whether you have to do something in order to be saved. So at that time, the particular work in question was circumcision. And the the, the Jewish Christians said, well, if you convert to Christianity, it's not just about believing, you've got to do something. For men, ouch, right? And so there was some pushback and they said, no, 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 it's about faith. It's not about works, And so in Acts 15, they get together as a body of believers and they have this conversation and they say, is it works or is it faith? And perhaps this is the first and only time that the entire Christian church agreed on something, but they agreed on this. Acts 15, 11 says, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. That's the Jewish Christian saying, it's faith It's the grace of the Lord that saves us just as it saves the Gentiles. It says, apart from works. But then this little debate between faith and works rears its ugly head again about 1,500 years later. Right? And this is the, the Protestant movement, when, when a, a branch split from the one, the one church, the Catholic church. Right, So what Martin Luther realized when he nails these 95 theses on a Catholic church in 1517 on Thanksgiving, or not Thanksgiving, uh, Halloween day, October 31st, we just celebrated 500 years since that happened. 
What he observed in that particular Catholic context was that they had a, a very works righteousness. He said what he observed was not people who had a genuine re- relationship with Christ. They just had religion. They thought if they could go through the motions and they could do all these things, then God would bless them, then God would save them, then God would forgive them only if they did actions. And so Luther said, no, 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 no. He, his big rallying cry was sola fide, faith alone. Uh, Luther was so big on this faith alone cry that he wanted to get rid of James from our Bible. Right? He didn't like that stuff we just read. He didn't realize how it harmonizes with the, whole, with the whole of the gospel. He wanted to get rid of that because he was so big on faith alone. But what he observed in the, the church of the time is that they were going through the motions. Have you ever gone through the motions? Some of you might be going through the motions right now, and that's okay. I know for me, when I go through the motions, uh, the most is uh, something that happens once a year at most churches that um, for a week out of the year is the bane of my existence. Um, I'm, of course, talking about uh, vacation Bible school. Um, <laughs> nobody tell Jerry, please. Um, so I, I love the idea behind Vacation Bible School. I love that it brings children into the community. It teaches them the Word of God. It teaches them great lessons. I have great memories of my childhood VBS. Now, as a somewhat adult, I, I can't stand it, right? Because the worst thing ever, and my wife's down here whispering about how much I do not like VBS, the worst thing for me is those first 10 minutes, right? Because what do you do? You get the kids together, you throw up the videos on the screen, and we're going to sing and we're going to do dances, and somehow I have to do that too. I, hmm, those dances, right? Because then I end up singing, you know, I've got the joy, 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 down in my heart, we're down in my heart, we're down in my heart. I, I can't do it, right? Fully going through the motions. Do I have the joy of the Lord in my heart in that moment? Absolutely not. Not a chance, right? But I'm going through the motions because it's what I'm supposed to do. What Luther observed is that many churchgoers at the time were going through the motions because it was what they were supposed to do. And he said, no, 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 no. It's, it's not about what you do. It's about what has been done for you. It's not about what you do. It's about what's been done for you. And so I would love to say that uh, the debate ended there and that we all can be on the same page. Uh, but unfortunately, I think we're seeing sort of a, a, a recapitulation of that again. Right? Because if you look at the graphs of church attendance in our country, if you look at the maps of church membership in our country, it peaked somewhere between 1950 and 1960. What was happening there? Church was the center of life for many people. It's where they met friends, it's where they interacted socially, it's where they made business deals, it's where their family had always gone. And so it peaked there, and then a steady decline, and then a sharp decline happening from the 90s until now. Why? Because it was expected that you would go through the motions in 1950 and 1960. Now, even though we see fewer numbers in church, we we should be a little bit alarmed. But to me, those of us who are left are the ones who say, I'm not just going to go through the motions. I'm not here because people expect me to be. I'm not here because it's going to help me in my business transactions. I'm not here because my family even wants me to be here. I'm here because I'm not going to go through the motions. I'm not seeking religion. I'm seeking relationship. And so that's encouraging to me. It's encouraging to me that even though we see numbers down, I think we see the faithful rising up. So kudos for being here. But so this has happened throughout history, this debate between faith and works. But, but we have to realize, too, that, that if we just read it on its face value, that yes, James and Paul would be kind of against each other, right? Because James said, it's not just faith, it's faith plus works. And Paul says, no, it's faith. But really, these two are the same side, or different sides of the same coin. Because both Paul and James were at the Jerusalem council. And they left agreeing that it's faith alone. So then what is James trying to tell us here? I think he's trying to tell us that we show our faith by our works. 
that true faith, if we have true faith, we will do no harm. We will do good. We will attend upon the ordinances of God. We will stay in love with God. That's how we show our faith. It doesn't save us. It shows our faith. Charles Spurgeon, I think, puts it uh, very beautifully. It's a long quote, but it's in your notes. He said this, A tree has been planted into the ground. And throughout scripture, we see God talking about the, the, the biblical authors using us as a tree and as roots abiding in the vine. This is a very familiar metaphor. A tree has been planted in the ground. Now the source of life to that tree is at the root. Whether it has apples on it or not, the apples would not give it life. But the whole of the life of the tree will come from its root. But if that tree stands in the orchard, and when the springtime comes, there is no bud, and when the summer comes, there is still no leafing and no fruit bearing, but the next year and the next, it stands without bud or blossom or leaf or fruit, you would say that it is dead. He says, you are correct. That tree is dead. It is not that the leaves could have made it alive, but that the absence of the leaves is a proof that it is dead. So too with the professor, the one who says they have faith. If he has life, that life must give fruit. If not fruits, works. If his faith have a root, but if there be no works, then it would depend upon the inference that he is spiritually dead, and that is certainly a correct one. What Spurgeon says is that to see if your life has faith, you will have fruit, you will have leaves. It's not that the fruit and the leaves bring you life, but they show your life. Do you feel that distinction? Just having apples on your spiritual tree does not bring you life. It doesn't save you, but because you have life, you will have fruit, you will have leaves, you will show your faith by your works. If that illustration doesn't work for you, um, I, I, I am... Uh, almost deathly afraid of heights. Not a heights guy, right? I'm the one that goes to Six Flags and I volunteer to hold all the bags, right? That, that is forever and always my job. I'm married to an adrenaline junkie, so it works out great. But I don't like heights at all. But uh, there was a time, I think sometime in eighth grade, I was at church camp and we do crazy things at church camp. And I decided um, that I was gonna climb to the top of the rock wall. Okay, right? Great big giant, I don't know, 40, 50, 100 feet, 300 feet, probably close to that rock wall. And I decided I'm going to climb to the top of this thing. Maybe, allegedly, I was trying to impress some girls. Who knows? I, I don't know. It was a long time ago. But so I climb up to the top of this rock wall, not thinking about how I was going to get down. All right, so I get to the top of this rock wall. I've got on my harness and everything and my rope, and I get to the top, and they say, okay, you're going to rappel down. Mm. I don't know if you've ever been rappelling. It's terrifying. Right, so I'm, I'm standing at the top, and, and there's, you know, the super cool camp counselor that, you know, has given me the Philippians 4 speech. You could do all things through Christ, even rappel down this 400-foot <laughs> rock wall. And um, so he goes through uh, this checklist, right? He says, is your harness on? I said, yeah. He said, is the rope good? I said, yeah. He's like, got all the clips on there. Yes, sir. Are you right with the Lord? Have you confessed of your sins? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I believed all of those things. I had faith that the, that the rope was going to hold me. I had faith that the harness was going to stay in place. I had faith that I had forgiveness for my sins in case something went terribly wrong. But... For all of that belief, none of it was going to mean anything until I leaned back. Until I put that rope into action, it didn't matter what I believed about that rope. I had to lean back. You were shaped to serve God. You were created and formed to put your faith into action. And that means leaning back on the rope. And so you may be asking, um, how? I, I, I'm a very type A person. I, I, my favorite week in school was syllabus week, mostly because there weren't lectures, but also because I loved getting the syllab- syllabi, syllabuses, 
syllabi. The syllabi. I loved getting it because here's what it said. It said, if you do all this stuff, if you show up on all these dates and read all this stuff and write all these essays, and here's an even rubric for how we're going to grade the essays, if you do all this, outcome is A. I love that. I thrive on that. And so for many of us, and I lean in this category sometimes, we want that syllabus for our faith. Even though we can even say, I am saved by grace through faith and not through works, we can say, oh, well, I need to know what I need to do. How many times a day do I have to pray? How many times a month do I have to go to church? How much money do I have to give to that homeless person? How, much do, how many houses do I have to build for people? What do I have to do? We want that syllabus. We want it cut and dry, but the Bible is not your syllabus. I believe that the Bible gives us some fundamental truths and some ways to live, but it's not going to tell you exactly how to live. But God has given you not only the gift of faith, but he's giving you a syllabus that lives inside of you called the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells in those of us who know Christ Jesus as our Lord knows who we are and knows who God has created us to be. And so the Spirit can lead us to do the things of God. The Holy Spirit, if we listen to the Spirit, will show us the way to go, will show us the sins to avoid, the good to do, the way to stay in love with God, but so often we quench the Spirit. Tonight, if you're wrestling with this, have I done enough? No, you haven't, but Jesus has. But if you still struggle with that, listen to the Spirit, that syllabus that lives inside of you. And if you want something a bit more concrete than that, because the Spirit is uh, unpredictable sometimes, um, I'll, I'll encourage you that if you've got the study guide for what on earth am I here for, on page 78, there's something called the SHAPE profile. S-H-A-P-E. It's Rick Warren, so everything uh, is an acronym. Um, SHAPE is uh, spiritual gifts. The H is, um, it's not habits, it's heart. What do you have a heart for? The A is abilities. The P is your personality, and the E is your experience. And it's this little test that you can take, and, and the idea is that it, it allows you to evaluate yourself. What kind of service can I do for God and his church? How can I do those good things that God has created me to do? Because you, you may be like this LaCroix can. You may have a tab on here that could hold a straw that you had no idea that you had that. God reveals to us those extra purposes, those layers of meaning that he has put in our DNA code to serve him. And until we take the next step, until we step out of that boat, until we lean back on that rope and try, we may never discover what it is that God has created us, how he has created us to serve him. And I'll leave you with this promise. That we serve God, we do these works, not just to show our faith, but we do it because it brings a smile to God's face. Hebrews 6, chapter 10 says, For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. He says, when we serve, when we stay in love with God, when we avoid evil, God looks down, God sees, and it brings a smile to his face. And if we have one main purpose here on this earth, it's to do exactly that. Not to work so that he will love us because he loves us more than we could ever imagine, but to work because he has loved us. Let's pray.